Hello, thank you all for coming out. This is Science Fiction and Social Justice. I'm your moderator, Kaylee Hearn, she, her. Um, I'm reviews editor at womenwriteaboutcomics.com. Um, and to get started, let's have our panelists introduce themselves, their pronouns, and say something about their work. Me first? Sure. <laughs> uh, it's like being home in first class. <laughs> so I'm Yasmin Omarada, um, pronouns are they, them. I'm a Middle Eastern uh, Muslim epileptic uh, comics artist, games person. Um, my recent graphic novel, Mashadara, is a uh, retelling of my experience as being epileptic and within the seizures. Um, some of the work that I've done that's a bit more relevant to this panel is like um, Rose Metal, which is a short comic in a anthology called Electrum about uh, mixed race experience, and that is pretty sci-fi. -y. And um, Being, which is a comic and a game with the same title about Palestinian futurism, like space cadets, Palestine, things like that. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Hi, my name is Kevin or K Chap. Um, I. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I am a white non-binary cartoonist living in Providence, Rhode Island. I make comics that um, deal primarily with themes of friendship because I feel like friendship is the greatest relationship you can have with another human being and it's very special to me. Um, and ideas of personal transcendence and community. Um, a couple of years ago, I put out a comic called Fuchi Perf, which um, sort of was a, a magically real, magical thinking look at a future where um, all the needs of Cleveland, Ohio were taken care of and people were happy and unified. And um, I think that's uh, something I think about a lot. And um, my current project, Four Years, is about a group of friends who love each, so, love each other so much that when they're around each other, flowers bloom out of them. Uh, my name is Ezra Clayton Daniels. Uh, I made a book called Upgrade Soul that came out last year, and a book called Bottom Feeders that came out in June. I am a biracial uh, man. My dad is a regular black man, and my mom was a regular black or white lady. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I make, I make work that explores the dichotomy of my interracial life experience. Uh, so a lot of my stuff deals with identity and people being trapped between two different uh, worlds. So Bottom Feeders, my new book, is about gentrification on the south side of Chicago and it explores uh, like my complicity as a person of color, uh, as a gentrifier, as a person who lives uh, in blighted or transitioning neighborhoods. Um, so it's very self-reflective, but uh, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I do. Uh, hi, my name is Carla Speed McNeil. Um, I uh, have been doing a, a long-running science fiction, speculative fiction comic called Finder since 97-ish. Uh, um, and um, as, a, as a writer of speculative fiction, I always uh, wanted to kind of, uh, you know, play with family social structures and, uh, you know, sort of try things on the way uh, they, you know, might work or, you know, go a little nuts with that. Um, I've always had um, uh, different biologies, uh, different ways of doing things that are, of course, perfectly normal in the context of the people who, you know, belong to these groups, whether they like them or not. Um, you know, creating an entirely separate family structure, you know, uh, and then creating the misfits for that structure are a lot of fun. Um, um, it's, it's hard to look at this stuff sometimes in a way that other people might see it because I didn't realize I was doing anything transgressive when I was coming up with it. I was so unaware of, uh, you know, the, 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 what would become identity politics later in my life. And I feel as though the wave washed up to meet me and is starting to answer all the questions about my own life that I never knew I needed to ask. And so I, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm a different generation from the, the, the depth of this wave, but I feel as though I've been waiting for it all my life. And uh, I will continue to explore all of these things that I was doing kind of blindly uh, with the, 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 the joy of knowing that this is a thing that other people always wanted to know about. So I, I, I want to listen to everybody. 
and, uh, and, and understand all of these things as, as best I can as things were always moving and reflect them in my work better and better. Great. Um, to start with, what makes science fiction the ideal genre for tackling social justice issues? For me, um, I came to discover just exactly how much I missed the old Twilight Zone back in 2016, because at that point, you know, you had a, 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 a man with a face in a dark suit with a face like a sad chimpanzee, you know, <laughs> telling you that, you know, racism is bad and sexism is bad and conformity is bad, as if it were perfectly obvious. And I remember when I was very small watching these old black and white shows going, of course, Perfectly natural, yes. And then the world turned inside out, and all of a sudden it seems not obvious to an awful lot of people that these things are bad. And, you know, the fact that it's now on Netflix made me go, oh, thank God. It's still there. It's still there. And, um, and Rod Serling, as, as, as mushy and sentimental as he could sometimes get, uh, was always very sincere, and all of the writers that worked on it were always ready to take familiar concepts and turn them inside out and uh, show, you know, okay, he didn't want to try to address the, um, the, the issues of super conformity of the 50s and post 50s directly. So he'd, you know, have a story where, you know, uh, you know, a woman with her face in bandages is just, just ready to, to kill herself over not fitting in with her society because she's so ugly. And, uh, you know, and the doctors and nurses always have masks on, and it's all built up to a big drama. And, you know, when the bandages finally Spoiler come alert. off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is a classic episode. You guys already know the ending here. I mean, come on, really. Uh, you know, a lot of time they were simple inversions. But he could use, you know, uh, he could use aliens, sometimes ridiculous aliens, to shine a light on, uh, you know, uh, crowd hysteria. Uh, you know, or any number of things, and use it as a filter so that people wouldn't immediately back away from what I gather is called the empathy bridge now. You know, you present it as a kind of a piece of theater with science fiction terms, tropes, and reshapings, and people would listen and uh, absorb uh, even though, you know, a lot of these things, if you, if you paid attention to them at all, were pretty harsh critiques of the time in which they evolved. You know, for me, that kind of, uh, you know, funhouse mirror approach uh, makes it very, very useful, you know, the most useful genre. You know, you can have culture clash in pretty much every genre you want, any type of fiction, but there, that's where it's really the kind of the point. Uh, you know, hard science fiction is all about the joys of rocket ships and ray guns, but, you know, down on planets, science fiction was all about people and weird alien cultures, whether your alien cultures, you know, had antenna or whether they were just ordinary humans. I would like to add something to that. I would like to say that I disagree with everything you just said. Go for no. it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> no, but I. No, do tell. But no, no. To, to be honest, I've been having a crisis of consciousness. Crisis of conscious? conscience. 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 That's the word I I'm could looking be for. Conscious. Yeah, conscience. That would work. Yeah. Better. About, yeah. about Absolutely. science fiction. I make science fiction, and I make science fiction in the realms that you're just describing. Like I, I came up on Twilight Zone, and I always saw science fiction as the perfect vessel to disseminate ideas that were too challenging for people to take face to take head on. Uh, and, and so that's what I do. That's what I've been, what I've been doing my whole life. Mm -hmm. But like, especially in the past couple years, um, it's become clear to me that people aren't taking the lessons. You know what I mean? Like Trump is like the worst cliche of a science fiction villain. We've seen him in a hundred different crappy science fiction movies. Like if someone yeah. wrote Trump as a villain. Mad Max. Yeah, totally. Mad Max, Back to the Future, everybody talks about Biff. Like we've been warned against <sighs> this character for years. Like Trump uh -huh. literally himself was a caricature parodied in things for years, it's and true. nobody took the lesson from it. And I think the thing about Twilight Zone, I'm a huge Twilight Zone fan. I love everything Rod Serling did. I just read the new graphic novel biography of Rod Serling, which isn't even out yet. I had this, this special <gasps> oh. secret hookup. It's so oh my good. Goodness. <laughs> 
But his whole thing was like, like you were saying, he was trying to get these, he was writing these stories, he was couching these social um, messages in science fiction because that was the only way to get it past the censor. Mm. But we don't have those censors in the same way now that we did back then. We also, I, I also don't see a lot of our science fiction as pushing that, right. that envelope the way it used to. You know? Yeah, totally. People, people don't always, aren't always ready to unpack things that are presented in these ways. You know, the people who, you know, do kind of, you know, it does kind of slide in. You know, I mean, it's not the answer to all social ills. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, fiction, a lot of people just don't read. Right. <laughs> um, and I, I think there's... It's an element. Sorry. What, I just want to say one last thing. I think there's like a way that you can use science fiction uh, to amplify certain themes in a way that isn't uh, obscuring those themes. Because I think when you obscure those themes, it becomes too easily for people to take the wrong message. Mm -hmm. So I think of like a movie like Elysium. Do you guys know that movie, that Matt Damon movie? I actually never saw the movie. I watched the trailer, though. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, <laughs> I got very upset by that trailer. But it's one of like a long line of movies that attempts to communicate what suffering as a minority is like to white people by casting white people as the oppressed minority in a story. Like, we've all seen the story, right? Yes. <laughs> but the lesson that people take from stories like that is that white people are oppressed. They don't take the lesson that they're trying it's to put each other in. It is kind of amazing how people can get the wrong end of the hammer on just about anything. Yeah. But anyways, sorry. Um, I would say, I would actually argue that sci-fi is pushing in certain communities. So places like SPX where you have a lot of young, uh, like LGBTQ plus uh, creators of color um, and you know identities, et cetera. Um, I think that sci-fi that is here, that is on the ground and is growing, I think that is Good. I think that commercial sci-fi, probably not, like very big budget sci-fi, but I think here and people in this room and people at this con, I think we are pushing. That's what counts. Mm -hmm. That's what counts. Yeah, um, I would say like going on to like the Funhouse Mirror type of thing, um, I would say like, yeah, like the big thing about sci-fi is that it gives different context for a lot of things. So like for my own work, um, for being the uh, Palestinian Futurism comic and game that I did. The basic story is that there, um, that Palestinians and Palestine has moved off planet, and that they live in a space colony. And there's like one space cadet who's sent on a mission back down to Earth, back to an old house near an old border, and like gathers artifacts from the past. And it's sort of about like past, present, futures. Mm. Um, and Great. the reason why I wanted to do that is because a lot of people don't think about Palestine past the next. 10 years. Mm -hmm. People don't really think about Palestine as surviving and growing and existing and technologically growing and being in space. Mm -hmm. And a lot of sci-fi about colonies and people like being like sort of stuck in space, not having a planet, not having a home. Like as a Palestinian, that sort of that, uh, that energy and that sort of plot device always drew me in. And I didn't really understand why until I made being. So it's not necessarily just recontextualizing things for other people, but also for your own self. Mm -hmm. And so like doing so gave me a better idea of what I feel for the future of Palestine and things like that. So I think it's kind of a two-way street. That's wonderful. You think the um, way I was thinking about this question is it, um, it's a genre where you, sort of like what you were saying, Yasmin, that you pitch your idea forward and it's like an exaggeration. It's like, let's change these things about this or amplify this and then set it where that is just how it is. And then you sort of, through world building or what have you, sort of cross, reverse engineer it back to something that makes more sense. And it allows people in because there's always already a suspension of disbelief that sort of you're like, oh, it's a fantasy world, it's in the future, it's like whatever, blah, blah, blah. But then that sort of like eases them into the pool of accepting this as reality. And then from there, you can sort of tease that, um, that sense is like, okay, this is normal, this is good, like queer people are everywhere, it's just normal, there's, they're not oppressed, like what would it take to get there? And I think going to Ezra's point, that is where it sort of trips you up. Like when I made Fiji Perf, it was like very aggressively optimistic and sort of like naively focused on like envisioning like a near perfect society. But then it's like, how do we actually like in our 
timeline get to that point mm -hmm. and it's like it's, yeah, you just need to do more than just make books, but I feel like the books need to be there. Yeah, I find that comics in particular is a really useful gateway to people, you know, like engaging in narratives about things in real life that they don't necessarily understand. It's, uh, I believe, like a little bit easier to digest in certain cases, and like it's almost like sort of like a, a space for someone to read something and kind of form their own thoughts about it without necessarily being in conversation with people in sort of like a private moment private experience with fiction. So all those things compounded, I think, make comics in particular, and especially like indie comics, uh, very important in this kind of genre. Mm. Um, <laughs> I wrote my very first piece of prose fiction eh, ever, like this year, Ooh, and uh, it, was, it was horrifying. Uh, oh. I think it came out really well, but the thing about it that gave me pause, the thing that really made it difficult, I wasn't, okay, you, have, you gotta like, Sometimes you gotta like rearrange your brain to do a new thing in a new way, which is good. But um, the the thing that gave me pause about the project was that I was being asked to uh, describe a utopia. Um, this was for The Verge, and the theme was you know utopian visions and things like that. And um, I have always found utopia kind of terrifying. Uh, this this country was based on an awful lot of ideas about utopia, and what I've always firmly believed, and still do firmly believe, is that all utopias are uh, inherently exclusive of some part of the population that are, is going to live in it. You know, I mean, it's always utopia for somebody. And the closest you can get, really, is how many of the people in the society living in the perfect world are actually having a good time. And, um, and I was just sort of like, I can't write a utopia. So I ended up writing a story in which quick shuddered through any number of you know, scenarios, each as different from the other as I could make. Mm with one character being the one to pull the magical Rod Serling level or lever to go, yep, screw this. Uh, let's try it again, like a one-armed bandit. You know, if I just keep pulling this handle, maybe eventually we'll get to the triple cherries and everybody will be happy. <laughs> nope, uh-uh. Because, you know, she's in the ugly position of having to decide, you know, if even one person in this world is, is on the bottom, then this isn't a utopia and we're just going to have to pull that lever again. And it was very hard to do. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's... you off something that you said, <laughs> then it went its own way. No, that's great. Um, to bounce off uh, the discussion about the Twilight Zone, what examples of science fiction that have addressed social justice has had any influences on your work? I don't know. <laughs> anybody, anybody, yeah, please. No. Well, I, I would say that, well, I, I still, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about utopias and oh, just like course, what you guys were saying. I was formulating a thought and I just like, I had a, sorry, I failed. I failed in a second way. But I just wanted to say that, yeah. I just wanted to say that I do think that there's a place for science fiction to be prescriptive. Um, and I think that's, for me, when science fiction is the most powerful is when it provides like not only a vision for what things could be like or how things could be better, but a, a little bit of how to get there. Mm -hmm. Like I look at, like, like Star Trek is probably my biggest influence and just the way like it, it, it created and visual, it visualized a post-capitalist society that functions. And it's like a society where people are judged by their contributions to the community rather than what they've been able to accumulate. Um, and I, it's oh, problematic in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I always looked at that as a, um, as a, I don't know what I'm saying. But anyways, there's something else you're gonna say. What was the other question I was gonna answer? Uh, yeah, uh, which influences? Sci-fi influences. That's what it was. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, Get Out is like the platonic ideal of like using speculative fiction to amplify a story because it uses the tools of speculative fiction to bring people in that wouldn't normally want to engage with the story that pinpoints. Um, microaggressions, mm -hmm. but it didn't obscure those points by recasting right. anything. So it's like you can't watch something like Get Out and not get the point that Jordan Peele, I think, wanted to get across. Mm -hmm. And I think he does such a brilliant job in that movie of um, sucking people into the narrative so that like by, like, spoiler alert, this isn't giving anything away. <laughs> but at the end of the movie, there's a scene where like the main character is almost getting away and in the background there's like 
uh, the red and blues of police lights. And if you've mm -hmm. gone along with this journey, when you see those red and blues, everybody in the theater is like, oh shit, it's mm -hmm. over, because we know like, where these people are coming from. And I think at that moment is when like, he got you. Because like, mm -hmm. even yeah. if your blue lives matter before that point, like, when you see that and you follow the, this journey with this guy, you understand the threat that that represents for that person. <laughs> um, that was um, like a influence, but also like very reassuring for me because to Terra is basically about like space colony, like very uh, similar to a lot of things I've spoken about, where it's like space colony of humans wanting to go back to Terra, go back to Earth, but not being able to. And for me, that was really reassuring because again, like I really connected with that story, and I don't think that I realized why I connected with those kinds of like longing for your homeland and very like emotional because like I feel like I'm very feelings <laughs> and not very like technical um so for me it was all of these like really intense emotions and all these very like beautifully rendered like drawings of people just being very like nostalgic and hopeful and longing for a place to call home for me reading that manga was like I get it like I get why I like these stories and that's part of why I feel like in like fiction manga comics is like so important. And I would say a general influence, um, maybe in the opposite direction, not necessarily one work, but also the, uh, the idea and the running undercurrent in sci-fi where um, a lot of like robots, androids, etc., etc., aliens are shorthand for undesirables. Like that's not a secret. We all know like that's shorthand. And seeing that so often was an influence for me in the way where I'm like, well, how about no? <laughs> like, let's flip the tables, let's normalize. Let's normalize um, like ourselves and represent ourselves in a genre that has constantly like punched down at us. Mm. So that's not necessarily a particular work, but rather just a lot of works and seeing that theme over and over again. I'm like, how about no? <laughs> how about we don't do that? How about we, you know, make it our own? Um I'm just like trying to rack my brain and I'm just like stuck on like one, that's the problem. No, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like my biggest one I grew up on and have recently like rediscovered my love for the X-Men, which is like kind of a Yay. very soft sci-fi, but just like <laughs> at its basis, yes. like baked More of a in. Magic kind right, of yeah. <laughs> which is like the totally the thing I love. Um, but yeah, it's just like at the like you squint your eyes and the very fuzzy version of that whole concept is that there are people who are kind of like other people who are idolized, but for some reason these people are disgusting and like are the going to um, replace another population. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a very loose sort of like move pieces. It's kind of like these different real life prejudices, but it's like a, a fiction make-believe. But when you can like buy into these lovable characters, like this guy's blue and he has a tail and he's so sweet, and it's like, <laughs> oh, I love him. And then you can sort of like get used to the idea of loving other people. I think that like in particular, X-Men has been very powerful for our generation in that way. Like I've, I've heard people express that before, and that's really amazing, I guess, that like it's been like that for so many people. Yeah, if I can interrupt for just a second. Yeah. Uh, House of X and Powers of Ten is pretty amazing. Yeah. Is your screen name still The Pretender? Yes, so it, my <laughs> screen name on um, Twitter is The Pretender Kaylee Hearn, Sorry, which is an in-joke if you deep. read of uh, House of X, <laughs> The Pretender Wanda Maximoff, it, you know, X-Men in joke. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, please. It's not based on that 90s NBC drama called The Pretender? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. <laughs> okay. But no, like House of X and Powers of Ten is really uh, tapping into more of the social justice themes of oppression um, and the human society not accepting the X-Men. And it's um, very like Jonathan Hickman getting very hard sci-fi. And it's really interesting if you haven't checked out an X-Men book in a million years, check out um, House of X and Powers of Ten. They're two interconnected miniseries and I think they're really great. And that's the end of my interruption. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I can't pick one influence, um, uh, I guess this is my moment to bang the gong for one of my favorite sci-fi writers that nobody else seems to know about. And uh, that is a woman named uh, Joan Slonsuski. I'll spell it if you guys want me to. Yes. S-L- 
O-N-C-Z-E-W-S-K-I. Hey, uh, she is that rare bird in science fiction, uh, that is to say a science fiction writer with actual science chops. She is a biology professor at Kenya University. And um, she has written a number of books, each of which build upon each other delightfully, not just in the usual, oh, I wrote a bunch of books and I would like to cobble them together so that they're all the same world for no particular reason. Um, her first book, she freely admits, was written entirely because she hated Frank Herbert's Dune so much. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. She hated it so much. Love a good spite story. Oh, yes. And it is a wonderful spite story. It's so good because she's created this entire ocean planet, because we're doing everything backwards, an entire ocean planet that is uh, occupied by a... Uh, an extremely egalitarian, um, well, you know, I say species, they're humans. They're humans who have life-shaped themselves, as they put it. Their, their uh, culture is entirely you know, biologically uh, based. They live on these great giant floating trees that just, they call them raft trees, and they, they, you know, they suffice as islands because the land is so far down that none of them has ever actually been there, and that you know, going down is only for the dead, as far as they're concerned. Mm -hmm. And um, they're a society that is going to suffer an invasion from an, uh, you know, a, a militaristic society that sees no value in them and uh, will have no particular regard for them, but will, which will attempt to enslave them and make them work. The thing about the the sharers, as they call themselves, is that everything about them goes two ways. Even their language, all the verbs, you have to, you know, use, you know, certain modifiers to say, I hit the hammer, the hammer also hits me. Mm. And when they're, when they're trying to explain this to our young question asking character, um, and he says, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. The woman who's talking to him says, well, don't you feel the shock when mm. you go up your arm when you swing a hammer? It's just like that. You have to understand what you're saying. Everything is recursive. Everything goes back and forth at the same time. And um, they don't regard you as an adult until you, at whatever age you feel ready, uh, you choose what they call a self-name. Everybody's got their milk name, just, you know, Bob, Jim, Carol, whatever. Um, of course, it's a little more science fiction-y than that. But just the same, everybody's got their personal name, but everybody has to choose an attribute of themselves that they dislike the most. So if they want to call themselves, you know, Bob the lazy or, you know, Carol the untrustworthy or whatever, they're going to lay bare their worst quality and then spend the rest of their lives trying to make pe to live so that people will go, that's your name? No. Mm -hmm. And it's a great honor to get to the point where people really are genuinely shocked to find out what your self-name actually is. Um, and the other thing that is necessary for them for adulthood is to be able to uh, master uh, this thing that they call white trance, which is to say that they can enter into a state of consciousness in which they cannot be compelled to do anything. They are gone. Their bodies are alive. They can come back out of it, especially if one of their children calls upon them. A child's voice can usually rouse them. But basically, at that point, they cannot be abused or threatened into doing something that they are opposed to doing. And they can will themselves to die if it gets that far from that point. Not until you are free from that level of coercion can you be considered an adult in this society. This made a really interesting unwinding of the settler colonist slave um, tropes in, in, uh, in, you know, the very uh, subject to the colonist metaphor, uh, all of these things in science fiction already. It's already pretty lousy with it. Um, and she did it in a really, a really fascinating way. Uh, I, I think that, the, that the, uh, the, the way she put all of this in there was very, you know, very different and very fascinating. And then she proceeded with each successive book to build another culture onto this 
space context, you know. Sometimes it's on the same world, sometimes it's on others, but each book adds a new layer of, and these people are like this, and this time period, this is the big thing. So a whole series of really, really, really fascinating books that are related in ways that make sense, that layer cultures that, you know, are each, uh, you know, individual enough and yet, uh, you know, um, have a reason to be layered onto one another, that they still have something to say from there on in. And uh, I, I don't know that I am able to do what Joan does, but every time I read one of her books again, it's just like, wow, wow, you know, that works. You know, oh, worlds don't always collide. Sometimes they just sit on the same bench together. Um, and uh, the way she does what she does is, is very able to reflect that, that truth. <laughs> was she contemporary to Herbert? Uh, she's maybe she's she's got to be in her sixties by now. Oh, okay, um, so she's still alive. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 still alive and still publishing textbooks. Wow. Yeah. She she had the uh, the women on the ocean world actually be purple in color. They call their thing white trance because in white trance the purple color drains out of their skin. Mm. The purple mm. color is a microbe that they call a breath microbe, which um, is colored by rhodopsin which was a molecule that she was studying for her, you know, for mm. her thesis work. And it, 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 it is, exists in the eye and helps to uh, perceive color, but it also traps oxygen. And when it is oxygenated, it is at its brightest. So these women's bodies are completely filled with this molecule, which enables them to stay under for hours. Once it drains out, they're, you know, they're white in color, they come back up, and they fill back up again. Wow. Blah, blah, blah. Joan Slazowski. Yeah. Damn. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, she's great. I love her. That's really cool. Um, yeah, and to build off that um, and to focus on the science fiction part of the panel title, uh, how do you approach world building in your works and incorporate elements of social justice issues into those? Mm. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like as creative, sometimes like it's hard to pinpoint where one at least for me, I feel like it's just a lot of things sort of kind of massed together. <laughs> like sometimes you have control over it, sometimes you don't. Um, but I, I guess a lot of it for me, as far as the world building goes, is like I go with what feels right with like my own like culture and identity and things like that. And I think a lot of like social justice, as we talk about it, is simply just daring to be loud about who you are and not being, you know, like not feeling like you need to minimize that and just being able to let it out in some way. Like, I think that that is a form of social justice. Mm -hmm. So for me, it just builds around kind of what comes naturally and like not censoring what I feel I should insert my own identity into my world. And then from there, I feel like it sort of builds around that. So it's not very technical, it's very like I guess, and also very feelings, as I said. That's, <laughs> so, that's great. Super feelings. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, I really focus on like a very small group, and it's just sort of like almost like automatic whatever is like drawn around them. Because I feel like in the world, there's just like so much and it's all really random and like the only things that we take as like brand names like just McDonald's. It's like a, somebody's name, it's just kind of nonsense, but for us, we've repeated it enough that it just like, it means something for us. So in whatever worlds I'm drawing, it's sort of like, it can literally be anything. To them, it means something and it's like, it can be ubiquitous. And maybe if I draw another scene, in the same city, there's like carryover, but I also, it's important to me to not make anything too uniform. Like I really am not about the sci-fi worlds that like everything is like super polished oh, steel God, and yes, glass please. and it's just like everything is like a mash of different cultures coming together and it's like there are different pockets. So it is, as long as it's centered around and feeding like the main focus of these like communities or like friend groups that I'm following around, it's sort of, um, yeah, how they interact with the things around them. As long as they're still human beings, then it's sort of like that's 
what the secret is for me. I think we probably have Mobius to thank for what mm. I call the dirty spaceship. Thank you, Mobius. You know, I mean, mm. he was hired to, uh, to do designs for a lot of movies back in the day. Um, Tron, for example, he did costume mm. design. Um, but, you know, when asked to create the, um, the feel of the environments in Alien, you know, he junked the place up. Uh, the, it wasn't a clean, perfect spaceship, you know, with everything polished and buffed. Uh, hmm? Mm -hmm. Me too. And, you know, I mean, he had stuff stuck to the windows and, you know, junk in the corners and everything. I mean, it was a lived-in place. It was what it would be like. Um, and I, I, I've always tried to, you know, keep the human fingerprints on everything. Um, I've, he's been a big influence on me. Um, me, the big departure point where I start with, uh, you know, uh, world building is always my continual fascination with the incredible breadth of um, extraordinary things that human beings do, the ways they live, the way they make things, you know, how different they can be and yet still be considered boring, mm. ordinary, dull, you know. Um, I had, a, I had a PE teacher in high school who had spent years learning how to make, you know, flint arrowheads, like sit there and bonk them into shape. And, you know, they were not as beautiful as the ones that are in the uh, uh, in museums, but they worked. He'd go out and shoot rabbits at dusk. He was crazy. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> stone technology is really, really, really difficult. Uh, and it took a great deal of skill to create. But for people who were really good at it back then, it was still an ordinary quotidian thing. Um, and that is completely beyond most of us, the idea of even finding the correct things to, to do them with. And, you know, for us, though, getting into a train that runs along underground, you know, while drinking a, a thing out of another thing that we no, neither of which we have any idea how to make, uh, is completely ordinary and dull and boring. We don't think about the whole process that led to any of these things. Although we should, it's really interesting. <laughs> the, the incredible number of things that we do that are magic that we don't think about is amazing to me. Not in, a, not in a bad kind of way. Yeah, that too, yeah. I mean, I can't make a metal spoon either, you know? I use them from time to time. Maybe about 30 years ago, when tablet computers were still just a little bit sci-fi. Mm -hmm. They still are, good grief. That's like serious Star Trek stuff there. Um, I'd like to actually, it's interesting we're talking about the dirty spaceship, and I've never actually seen Alien, uh, so I don't, I, but I know like kind of what you mean about things being like looking lived in and there's stuff everywhere and it's mm -hmm. dirty. Um, it's an interesting point, but I would actually argue that that may not be the case as far as like what it actually would be. Oh, like. right. Well, yes, well, there would be well tended ships. Well, it's interesting to me though because um, a lot of my work focuses on like Islamic futurism. Mm -hmm. And again, everyone's different, not everyone is like this. My room is a mess. But in Islam, uh, like cleanliness is very important. Um, and I would argue that there is a very real possibility that like a lot of spaceships would be immaculate in some like uh, versions of Islamic futures. So it's interesting that it we're talking smell about better. <laughs> about like what things like would be or would not be like like that differs so much depending on where you're coming from. And, oh yeah. And, like not everybody who is Muslim is like it must be clean. Of course, everyone is different. Again, that actually would make a, a pretty good story though, don't you think? Maybe. Yeah. Um, People just arguing about the condition of the interior of the spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just I I thought that would maybe to bring up where it's like it actually my in particular spaces it might actually be like that mm. I, uh, I think that in the case of the Nostromo which is the name of the ship in Alien uh, the reason it was probably so filthy and ill kept is because all of the people living and working on the ship were corporate drones with no investment in the ship itself it was not their home it was a job that they had that they hated yeah I guess the only thing that's really about Alien is that the main character is like a space trucker I guess yeah they're, <laughs> yeah, they're kind of Kind of like that, yeah. So, again, I don't really know much about it, but I, I know what you're saying, and I think that it's interesting that those two things could be totally different. Absolutely. I was just going to um, express that I feel that um, underlines one of your initial points, just like who is picturing these futures, who is occupying these sci-fi realities, who is creating these things, and like, whereas 
mainstream, usually we can say it is tending for like the well-off white um, male supremacy. And um, all the other spaces who are creating their own sci-fi for themselves and developing their own futures and making them a reality. That's sort of like where, you know, as a white creator, when I'm making these things, I'm a lot of the time trying to not put my own like needs into it, but I'm sort of imagining beyond and that's sort of where I'm coming from when I talk about like imagining like a mass diversity because just like um, thinking in terms of like like growing a garden, like monocultures are death and poison. And it's just like a, a overgrown, beautiful, like thriving, like um, jungle of a garden is like what I envision as a healthy future, so. And I, I think your approach is really amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I would add, um, as far as world building goes, I personally have been really into metaphor lately. I'm like, I've just discovered metaphor. <laughs> like, it's fun. How can I milk this? <laughs> yeah, totally. But it, for me, like, I'm a very like controlled and anal writer. Like, I have to have everything planned out, and like, I have to understand what everything means in a story before I can really like um, embrace it and start working on it. It's responsible of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, like, with my last nice. book. Nice, clean spaceship. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but like with bottom feeders, uh, I started with the metaphor um, of this creature that lives inside a building representing culture and how everybody around, like everybody in the orbit of this building slash creature are trying to um, take advantage of, the cre of this creature and, and the culture for their own um, means. So bottom feeders is a metaphor for cultural appropriation, even though it's like ostensibly about gentrification, but it's really about people trying to take advantage of a culture. Um, and that just like helped the story write itself because I knew that like everything always had to come back to this metaphor. So all the characters represent different archetypes and cultural appropriations so that made that really easy for me. But as far as world building, I personally am really into like the nuts and bolts of like the way things work when you tweak something uh, in a in a society. Like I can't really think of any great examples that you guys would know off the top of my head, but I can think of a great example of something that just came out that does it really badly um, <laughs> based on the trailer that I just saw. Uh, <laughs> you're just a trailer hound, aren't you? <laughs> There's this new trailer that just came out for this new Jason Momoa show. Have you guys seen it? I think it's called C. Oh, yeah. And it's oh, wow. just like, it's a story. It's for like Apple, the new Apple TV, but it's a story about like, imagine. Playing Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's like imagine a world where everyone uh, goes blind and these two children are born that have the power of sight. And like, but the premise of it is like, <laughs> it's like you imagine. I don't know. It's like it's such a stupid, idiotic, problematic premise to start with, but like, but in the in the story, it's like it's basically just Game of Thrones, but everybody's blind. So everybody is like still shooting bows and arrows, and they have knives and stuff, and they're chasing around. But everybody has like these um, white contacts on their eyes to show that they're oh blind. Boy. But I'm like, if you actually imagine a society where everyone inexplicably went blind, like imagine the technologies that people would have to devise to navigate this world, mm -hmm. and that would make for such a more interesting and nuanced and textured world than just being like they're blind but they still have knives and, and stuff like that. So I like, I'm just like really into like, like you tweak something and then you follow the way that that technology or that tweak affects like the economy, transportation, Absolutely. like everything. Cause that just like makes everything so much more interesting there's and that, weird. There's that book Blindness by Jose Saramago. Yeah. I never finished it. <laughs> Octavia Butler, the, the great, uh, had a short story in which, uh, you know, some, you know, not really, didn't really go into the details, but a, a plague had reprogrammed the entire human species to be unable to uh, conceive of language and use it at all. Mm. You're still yourself. You're still, you know, in your head, un understanding. Um, but you couldn't formulate it in any way. Sign language mm. gone. All the languages gone. Mm. How the uh, how the the whole species would be able to uh, you know interact with each other individually without even having a name. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, uh, a, a person would choose, uh, you know, an object to represent what they remembered of their name. And, uh, you know, but of course, the, your ability to understand what that name might actually be. You know, if a, if a, if a person wears, a, you know, a copper penny on their shirt, you know, does that mean their name was Penny? Does it mean their name was, you know, cent? 
whatever. Yeah. You know, does it name, mean the name of copper? Does it mean, you know, whatever? Does it mean the name Lincoln of circle or, or whatever? Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Could be anything. What else could it be? Um, there was Daddy fans. Absolutely no. <laughs> there is no way to know with any greater clarity what that was. And, um, and inevitably, what that led to is, you know, we're going to have the two, you know, small children who show up having been born into this languageless world who are doing what, you know, very close twins sometimes do, that is to say, making it all up. Mm -hmm. And children have been born in this world who still are affected by this thing. <laughs> These are just the first two who haven't been. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the protagonist trying to protect them and listen to them, you know, in despair. Yeah. Uh, it was mm, one of her shorter ones, but certainly a very vivid one. Wow. Uh, great. Um, would like to open it up for questions now. There are two microphones behind the gray pillars, if anybody would like to go up and ask some wonderful questions. <laughs> oh, all right, cool. oh, yeah, Thanks. go ahead. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, hi. So, I, I, I teach middle school age children, and they're super into sci-fi. And I've introduced them to Le Guin, and um, to paraphrase something along the lines of, good sci-fi is not descriptive of the future, I'm sorry, predictive of the future, it's descriptive of the present. Um, now I heard a lot of sort of differing opinions on that one, so rather than going down that particular rabbit hole, <laughs> I'd like to know, where do you think sci-fi, good sci-fi, as you, as you describe it um, individually, at what age do you think it's its most effective? What age reader? Yeah. Mm. Mm. I, honestly, yeah. I, that's just my opinion. I think mm. it's, um, you never know what <clears throat> could impact you at any point in your life. There have been things that I've like taken in as an adult that like maybe a, a child would find impactful in the same way, just in different mm. stages of our lives. So I'm sorry, that's kind of a long answer, but I honestly think any, any age really. I do think that, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an acquired taste for some people. Uh, and that, you know, when you're a kid, you just take everything in. Mm -hmm. So um, science fiction that is, uh, you know, absorbable for young kids uh, is, is, is always um, uh, a, a necessary thing, I think. Because you don't get a taste for it later in life most of the time without having it been exposed to it at all, you know. I mean, I was... Uh, I, when I was eight years old, my mom wanted to have my portrait drawn, and uh, I was a wiggly, ADD-ish sort of kid. And my mom finally told the artist, just wait till Star Trek comes on. <laughs> and I sat blankly. <laughs> and that's what the portrait looks like, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say, too, like, I would say ASAP, as early as possible. I feel like, like if... Like when you asked the question, what I heard was, at what age is it best to expose children to good ideas? <laughs> nice, I like that. I'll take what those can snaps. I add? <laughs> <laughs> what can I say but snap? I, I think uh, another big thing is always to uh, get kids um, exposed to the idea of picking apart the elements of their own culture, even if it's just a simple thing like manufacturing, because there's no simple, there's no simple object in human culture. It all has a history. Even if you just start picking apart last names, the etymology of place names, all that kind of thing, there's a wealth of information to be had out of any of these endeavors. And, you know, your young nerdlings are gonna be excited by that. And, uh, you know, the breakdown is where you begin to build back up. It brings to mind, um, I think one of the most important and fundamental lessons I was ever taught was that, um, Everything is in somebody's interest, and it's up to you to like determine whose interests are being served. And I was taught that in high school, so maybe I could have used it earlier, but. That's good. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Good luck. Hi. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, and I'm and struggling trying to figure out how to articulate my questions because so it's it's not there yet. But um, I'm kind of wondering whether some of this is maybe we're going about this the wrong way uh, with regard to things like identity politics and cultural appropriation. I, I mean, the, the, 
these these things are are. Uh, I mean, it, it's it sounds like very much like a, the balkanization of society, uh, as opposed to perhaps using science fiction as as perhaps a means to try to say, wait a minute, we can bring elements of society together. Um, the, the issue of cultural appropriation is, is a, well, once something is out there, well, well, why can't I use it? <laughs> you know, I, I really- you have for a long time, we all have for like, Centuries. I, so I, I mean, I, I'm I, I'm hearing some of the things that, that you guys are saying, and 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 I'm just I I I I, I get concerned that 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 w that we are thinking about victimization, uh, that we are thinking of personal oppression as opposed to saying, look, there are issues in society that need to be addressed, that can be addressed, that should be addressed, that in some ways are being addressed and are not. Uh, and, and we can use science fiction to, to, to try to further these goals, but, but I, it, it seems to me that, we're, that, that, if, that if we're getting into a balkanization as the goal, it's, it's not, it, or, or it's, the outcome doesn't look good. I, well, I would say if, if, if you, like if, if you're not interested in people making science fiction about cultural appropriation or whatever issues that you're not interested in, there's plenty of science fiction. Science fiction is a big place. Like if you want to watch a science fiction movie that shows white people suffering, there's those movies or whatever, you know what I mean? There's a lot of issues that we're all facing and like there's no way for us to move forward until everybody is, like everybody's issues are addressed. And I think that's like what well, we're all up here trying to address issues that we're all passionate about. And if you're not passionate about those ideas, that's fine. Like you can be passionate about, about other ideas, but what I'm saying is science fiction is a big place and it's playing big enough for everybody. And like that's what's great about it, in my opinion. Yeah, it seems like we all fundamentally disagree with the like basis of your premise. Yeah, I, I have no doubt. I, I'm just, I, I get concerned. I, I know that the people behind me, but I just, I just get concerned that there's a balkanization here. It's not a death sentence either. You know, I mean, it's not a, you absolutely cannot, don't touch ever. It just means you need to take a look at, you know, where the things came from and who they came from. Uh, you know, I mean, you uh, you can you can say I love French food, I love French clothes, I love French countryside, I love French this, but somebody's gonna quite rightly step up and say, but what about French people? And appropriation is an issue because it ignores the existence of the people whose culture that it is. Uh, it puts it aside and says that they're not important, that they're, you know, that, you know, it's okay for us to do these stories about these people, but, you know, just because there's no, nobody from that culture saying anything about it, that's okay. And monetizing it. I mean, I know we're supposed to rap, but the thing about appropriation is when it's monetized. When someone creates something and then someone else who has the means to get something mass produced or has the means to get a, like a, a loan from the bank to like make a rap album or something, like when Iggy Azalea makes a rap album, it's like she's taking something that someone else created, monetizing it and profiting from it in a way that no one else is able to do because they don't have the same privilege that someone who's like, you know, traditionally beautiful and blonde and skinny and white is able to, to to profit from. Yeah, I, I think that this uh, discussion and sort of this question that you're asking, I think might be larger um, internally for you than this panel, and uh, larger than all of us talking at you. I think that um, it would be best for you to sort of, again, think about it, think about why you feel that way, and maybe do some research and do some reading into stuff that maybe you might not have considered like experiencing yeah. before. I, I guess I guess the, the uh, I'm, my, I'm my sorry, final sir, point we have on to that, wrap, uh, wrap up now. Um, okay. But thank you all for your wonderful responses for this, and thank you all for coming to the science fiction and justice panel. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>